Good morning, everyone. Our first scripture lesson is Psalm 122. And as I was uh, contemplating the scriptures I was to read this morning, I was thinking that the Psalms are actually songs. And as songs, they're poetry. And I was just wondering, did they rhyme in their original verse? I have to ask Pastor Jeff about that later. I don't know Hebrew. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there the thrones for judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Our second scripture lesson is from Acts, and I have to say it's one of the longer ones I've read, but that's not really at the point. It's a story, and a story sometimes needs to be a little bit longer. But I do have to tell you that there's one spot in here that in Bible study that came up that struck most of us as being a little odd, and that was that Paul became annoyed. And so listen to the, to the words one day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, the jailer put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, for he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to the jailer and all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, the jailer took Paul and Silas and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he, as an, he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. 
When morning came, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported the message to Paul saying, the magistrate sent word to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul replied, they have beaten us in public, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison and now they're going to discharge us in secret? Certainly not. Let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. And the magistrates took Paul and Silas out and asked them to leave the city. If you are observant, you may notice that there is something wrong with this slide. There are two different spellings of liturgia on the slide, one with an O and one without. That's because Pastor Brenda and I, when we planned this sermon series, wanted to find all five words for the original vocations of the church, and we wanted their transliterations to be from the Greek. As the church first became established, Greek was the common language used, and so the five original vocations of the church were expressed in Greek, and so let's transliterate them in Greek ourselves. Well, we found two spellings, two transliterations for liturgia, and um, so we've ended up using both. I prefer the spelling with the O. If you... uh, Even if you've been here for all of the other four sermons in this series, it is probably worth a quick review uh, just to remind you of what we talked about. In Kerygma, I talked about how we have good news to share, and I suggested that we figure out how we might share it in this changed and changing world. In... uh, Diakonia, Pastor Brenda reminded us that the historic, about the historic healing ministry of the church and how that ministry continues to this day, just without quite so many miracles involved, but the healing continues. In Didache, Pastor Brenda reminded us that the, of the historic ministry of teaching people about God's love and hopeful vision of the new world and how that ministry continues. In Koinonia, I suggested that the world still needs the stratification-breaking power of Christian fellowship and community. And today we turn to the fifth and final original vocation of the church, Laeturgia. This may be the most recognizable of the five words, uh, unless you are fluent in Greek, uh, because we have an English word, Uh, that derives directly from it. And this sounds similar, and that word is liturgy. Most people hear the word liturgy and think of pomp and circumstance of formal worship services. Some churches, some denominations are actually described as liturgical, meaning that they put a lot of emphasis on the smells and bells of worship services or that their denomination provides a prescribed order of worship, often prescribing the exact words that are to be said. In the United States, the Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Episcopal churches, sometimes even Lutheran churches, are described as liturgical. The reality is that just about every congregation that has their worship rituals to some extent, is liturgical because they have a liturgy that they use. That is true of our congregation to some extent as well. And as I said in our threshold moment, the word liturgy, liturgia, literally means the work of the people. The word comes from two other words, laetos and ergos. Laetos meaning public and ergos meaning work. So the work of the people, the liturgia, is essentially public service. 
Somewhere along the line, the church narrowed down this understanding of the work of the people, this understanding of public service to just our worship services that happen in our sanctuaries. I certainly have been guilty of that. And then the events of the past two weeks happened in the context of contemplating today's reading from the book of Acts. And I found myself wondering, as Tripp Hudgens put it, why do we set the two practices, what we do in worship and what we do after, at odds with one another? I've become more convinced than ever that both practices need to be seen as liturgy, as ways that we fulfill the vocation of liturgia. In two wonderful, simple paragraphs, Walter Brueggemann summarizes what happens in the story that we heard today and how it juxtaposes a greedy, self-deceiving status quo society and the way of Jesus. There is a used slave girl fortune teller who thinks that the future is all fated and can be programmed in a way of certitude. There are money-making exploiters, the banker pimps who use the innocent fortune teller to generate private wealth. There are the magistrates who use their authority to maintain the status quo and prevent any social disturbance and there's a prison that is a social statement about power and order that constitutes a threat to any who would act outside the box. Into the midst of these fixtures of a stable society come the apostles who assert an alternative way of salvation. The new way of wealth being exposes all the old ways as failed frauds. In reaction to such news, the magistrates by decree and the mob by violence try to stop the news of this other way. But we're told suddenly all the fixtures of shutdown control are shattered. The text makes no direct connection between the news and the quake. It only lets us imagine that God's new power is on the move. It's no wonder that the ones who know sing and pray and praise and praise and praise. We praise because we know the prison houses of fear cannot contain God who gives life and breath and all things. So would you, would you be one of the ones who prays and praises and sings? It's not as if the themes of the story have changed all that much. Our criminal injustice still, a system still runs very much by the gold rule, not to be confused with the golden rule. The gold rule is the one that says the one was the gold rules, Paul and Silas might have been charged with promoting Jewish practices, which were apparently illegal for them to be doing in Philippi, but they got into trouble because they were messing with the economic system. And in, if the idea of Paul, a Roman citizen, being thrown in jail seems uh, something strange from millennia ago, just do a quick Google search of stories about U.S. citizens being detained by immigration and custom enforcement. Jason Biasi turns out, points out that there is a swinging back and forth of the powers of oppression and the powers of freedom in this story. The story in Acts 16 starts with despair, slavery, demon possession. Liberation interrupts as the girl is healed, but the evil returns as it's wont to do, mob violence, trumped up charges, torture, jail. Grace interrupts again with an earthquake, barred doors are open, no oh, freedom. Evil returns with a move towards suicide, then grace triumphs, salvation for a household, baptism, a meal together, the end. 
In fact, as Cindy Sojourner pointed out during last Monday's Monday morning Bible study, the scene in the jailer's home is a communion scene. It's a reenactment of the Last Supper. The jailer washes Paul and Silas's wounds. I assume those wounds are not just the wounds from the beating, but also the wounds from having their feet in stocks. The jailer washes their feet. And then he shares a meal. They come to the table together and break bread. So as I reflected on this story this past week, the liturgy, I realized that in the story, the liturgy of the church is taken into the streets three times in the story. First, Paul and Silas are proclaiming the good news, the way of salvation to all who would listen, and then they're singing and praying in, uh, together in the prison, and finally they celebrate a communion of sorts with a jailer and his family. The liturgy of the church out beyond the walls of the church. And looking back at this vocation of liturgia, I find myself wondering how we can take liturgy to the streets as we step forward into this changed and changing world. And then on Tuesday, word came about the shooting, the mass murder, this one at a school, this one, 19 children and two, church, two teachers killed. And I realized that this is certainly one place where we must bring the liberating liturgy of the church into the streets. And I realized that this is certainly one place where we must bring the liturgy of the streets into the church. The second mass shooting and killing in fewer than a dozen days. The earlier one took place on Saturday, May 14th in Buffalo, New York. We mustn't forget the people killed there. Celestine Cheney, Roberta Drury, Andre McNeil, Catherine Massey, Marcus Morrison, Hayward Patterson, Aaron Salter, Geraldine Talley, Ruth Whitfield, Pearl Young, each of them a beloved child of God, each of them killed by gun violence and racist hatred, each of them should have been able to just go to the grocery store and buy some food in safety. And likewise, each of the children and the two teachers killed in Uvalde, Texas, must not be forgotten. I want to say their names as well, even though I know I'm not good at pronouncing Spanish names, and I will say some of them incorrectly, but I want to say their names. I'll find the right angle so I can read. Mate Rodriguez, she was age 10. Thank you. Maite Rodriguez was age 10. Tess Mata, age 10. Miranda Mathis, age 11. Alexandria Rubio, age 10. Layla Salazar, age 10. Irma Garcia, age 48. She'd been a teacher for over two decades. Ilya Silguero, age 10. Jackie Cazares, age 9. She just celebrated her first communion two weeks earlier. Amore Joe Garza, age 10.
Eva Mireles, age 44, described as a transformational teacher. Jose Flores, age 10. Javier Lopez, age 10. Lizaya Garcia, age 10. Ellie Garcia, age 9, just a few days shy of turning 10. Elihana Torres, age 10. Rogela Torres, age 10. Nevar Bravo, age 10. McKenna Elrod, age 10. Annabelle Rodriguez, age 10. Alethea Ramirez, age 10. Jace Luvanos, age 10. Paul and Silas were stripped, beaten, locked in stocks in the innermost depths of the prison. And there in the dark and the filth and the smells, they started singing and praying. They found themselves, as the church in its earliest decades found itself, the object of anger, persecution, hatred, and fear. All those emotions once directed at Jesus, all those emotions that led to Jesus' execution were now directed at Paul and Silas. It could have led to bitterness. It could have led to seeking of revenge. But Paul and Silas knew how the story ends. Because they knew the power of the resurrection, they could turn from their hatred and fear and invite the people around them into a life with God. Instead of responding to their jailer with revenge or violence, they invited him and his family to know the God of life. Upon his return from the 1965 Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March with Dr. Martin Luther King, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was asked, did you find time to pray? And he answered, I prayed with my feet. As Christians, we must advocate for life in the midst of death, for justice in the midst of oppression, and for peace in the midst of hatred. Our liturgy, our public work, must not be limited to the confines of our sanctuary. It must go into the streets. And in doing so, our very lives will become a prayer and we will offer God all honor and praise. Amen.